Um, was there? A, you yeah, I had a question uh -huh. um, specifically about this idea of making a character proactive, <laughs> because I feel like you know, again, we have the situation where yep. we have characters that are reacting to things that they didn't expect to happen. Mm -hmm. So how is it that we go about making them? proactive working towards something that is not related to the main action of the story? That's a fantastic question. You win a gold star um, in the form of a Sour Patch Kid. Um, so good question. Um, th this is basically digging into the villain dilemma. How do we make our heroes as interesting as our villains when they're reacting against our villains? Or how do I make the protagonist of my story protag? Howard likes to say that. Um, protagonist, protag. Uh, it's a verb. Um, how do you make your protagonist protag? Uh, one way is to look at their hobbies and passions and have them be working toward one of those as they're being interrupted and they keep doing it. Um, a good example of this is, I mean, we, we oftentimes people use the opening of Raiders of the Lost Ark as a great way to establish sympathy and rooting interest for a character who is following their passion and yet things are going wrong, right? Um, at the end of the opening for Raiders of the Lost Ark, go watch it again, Indiana Jones does not end up with the idol that he was trying to get for his museum. But he tries so hard, and he is so capable, um, despite getting knocked down, he becomes an underdog, despite how capable he is. And this shows we start the story with him being very proactive. And then from there, you know, he goes on this adventure to deal with Nazis, and Nazis keep getting in his way, and he can react against the Nazis. But since we started off with this extremely proactive start, um, it helps us cement in our mind Indiana Jones is an active character who's working toward his passions. Uh, so showing your character in a scene where they are pursuing some sort of hobby or interest or goal of theirs, and then that gets interrupted, because of what's going on, can initially establish our character in an interesting way as someone who does things. Um, I'm using a lot of adventure stories as my examples. This, this doesn't necessarily have to be an adventure story. This works just as well for a, you know, a young kid in school who is, you know, their passion is art, and they're going to get interrupted by moving to a new city and having to deal with things. Um, and you could see how showing them initially being passionate about something and then finding out that they have to leave and leave it all behind could be helpful in establishing rooting interest and the, the, how the capable the character is before you uproot them and then start telling their story where everything's against them. They move to the new place, everybody hates them, um, and you know, there's, there's some rival who's trying to destroy this, uh, this poor girl's life, and how do we deal with this and all of these things. So. Show them. That's one way. Show them doing these things. Um, another way is what we call the try-fail cycle, which is um, we'll do a lot more of this in the plotting section. But the idea is that you have your character try initially and fail to achieve to to, to work against the problems. Um, there's a, there's an old adage in um, in in storytelling that has to do with uh, that. I've recently seen it. Um, post is an internet, um, internet meme. Meme? You say meme, don't you? Yeah. Um, which is, um, people like to point Han Solo. When uh, on this, the second Star Wars movie, uh, when the doors open and they're expecting to go to dinner and there is Darth Vader there, what does Han Solo do? He pulls out his gun and shoots. <laughs> All right? He doesn't say, you betrayed me. He doesn't say, whoa, Darth Vader's here. He takes out his gun and shoots. Does it work? No. It's futile, but he tries. And we have, because of things that he does, cemented in our head that Han is proactive. Han does stuff. Han doesn't say, oh, I'm so surprised. So Han gets out his gun and shoots. Um, and this establishes a huge amount of rooting interest on our parts with Han. Despite being you know, somewhat deeply flawed in a lot of areas, we love Han because of this. This is really what makes Han awesome. Han is actually not that capable. He's OK capable. But he's really not that <laughs> capable. He usually doesn't do things right, and they don't usually work out. But boy, is Han proactive. Han doesn't stand there. Han's, Han picks up the microphone and starts talking. Yeah, everything's OK here. How are you? Um, <laughs> you know? And we laugh. Um, but we love Han because of that, right? 
this is another way to make your character proactive in the face of something going um, very wrong, is they do things. They don't just sit there and, and, um, and say, oh, no, or get worried or run hide. You know, they're the ones that are like, well, uh, dragons are attacking our city. I'm going to go and try and shoot my catapult at them because I'm not a very good warrior, but I built a, what, a ballista. I'm going to take them down. Um, we like that kid in, um, in How to Train Your Dragon because when the dragons attack, even though he's the weakest, smallest one, he doesn't go hide. He goes and grabs on his, best, his bastille and tries to take one down. Um, and that's what this is, okay? This is the proactive stuff. I keep talking to this one. I mean this one. All right. Wait, so is the proactiveness, is that like mostly facade? Because, I mean, there's lots of movies where, like, the heroes being all proactive, like, they're almost stopping it. Or, like, yes. They succeed, and then essentially at the end of the day, the villain's plan, step A proceeds perfectly, and then they yeah. go step B, he tries to stop step B, and then and they don't meet Oh, so it's only the very end where they actually like, stop the villain from succeeding. Yes, that's what I was talking about earlier, where you could have them succeed in Chapter 2, and your story would be done. Wait, so, I mean, is that like it's all a facade. Everything in a story is a facade. Kate, get that in your head. You are making it up. You have absolute control. There is no realism. You, you, I mean, even if your story is a Jane Austen-esque um, romance, you know what? In chapter two, the arrogant guy that offended her in chapter one, she could find out that he's actually very sweet, and they could fall in love, and the story could end. And you could make that ending happen. Now telling your stories about, you know, again, people are going to buy into this. You have to do it in a way that they buy into it. You, um, you don't want to, as a friend of mine says, do deus ex wrench. I'll get to you in a sec. Deus ex wrench. I think Howard came up with this one too. I can't remember. No, 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 no. This was, uh, this was Bryce, um, uh, Bryce Moore. Um, he called something called deus ex wrench where the Deus Ex Machina is where the reader feels that the, the, he, the author artificially saved the heroes in the end when they shouldn't have been saved. Deus Ex Wrench is where you artificially inflate the length of your story um, to the reader's noticeability by throwing in problems that don't feel realistic. Um, and this is, this is a real issue. You want your, the problems and issues to feel real. Um, this is also called idiot plotting, if you do it the wrong way. Meaning, the only reason that uh, the characters don't get together or that anything goes wrong in the book is because the characters are idiots. That's a bad place to be. Um, and the difference between the characters being idiots and the characters being real characters with, with deep flaws is a matter of good writing and foreshadowing, really. If you can convince us in chapter one that this flaw that the character has is a real issue preventing them from getting together with the, 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 the character that you want them to get together with in chapter three, the reader will buy into it. It's OK. We all have flaws. We understand this. They're going to work on it. If instead they have no realistic reason um, in chapter three, you haven't done your job right, and it looks artificial. It is all artificial. Your job is to make it not look artificial. Does that help, help Scott? Do you understand? So. Going back to an earlier example, you were mentioning dragons attacking. Yes. Dragons attacking is a situation, but at the same time, there's somebody who's able to be proactive in the situation. Do you need to have a balance between situation and proactivity, or is there a way to have them both in the same place? I don't know what you mean by situation versus proactivity in that statement. You said earlier on that yeah. if you just throw a situation at a character and then they react to it, then yeah. they become a reactionary, bland character. Right. But it seems. No, no, that doesn't, that doesn't necessarily make them 100% bland. What it makes them is reactionary, and we lose some of our rooting interest. And you're right. The problem is that the rooting interest tends to go to the person being proactive. And this is the villain problem. Uh, you know, if the characters are only reacting to the villains, we, we sometimes have an issue. In Hollywood, they actually split this up by, by doing three acts and saying, you're OK in act one reacting. Hollywood says, act one is react. Um, act two is um, is try and make it work worse. In other words, the you know now you you've you've tried now reacting is different from being proactive and saying okay we need to do something about this rather than just waiting for the villain to do something and stopping them. That's reaction. Action is there's a villain in town. I need to outthink him and lay a trap for him. Is proactive rather than reactionary. There's a bit of reaction to it, but you're never going to get rid of that bit of reaction. Um, so in Hollywood, it is act one, react, 
Act two, make it worse. Act three, try a Hail Mary, and it succeeds. Um, right? Um, I don't particularly love three act format simply because um, the way that Hollywood talks about things, they're very smart people. They know what they're doing, but they're limited by their screen length. And because of that, they tend to focus very much on you need this here, you need this here, you need this here. You only have you know, 100 pages to tell your story. Um, but we're telling stories that are much more free form. And because of that, we don't have necessarily to worry as much about the rigidity of these sorts of things. But there's a lot you can learn from three act format with this. And so in, in your question right here, what they would say is, yes, the character's reacting. And they'll probably spend the first act only reacting. Then they will find ways to start acting, and, and, but the problem's going to get worse. And then they do a very proactive thing at the end, which is crazy and outside the box. And wow, I can't believe anybody thought of that. We're going to need lots of guns. Um, yeah, um, this sort of thing. Nobody fights back against an agent, right? You can't do that. Um, the outside the box, super proactive thing, and then it succeeds. And that's their format. Um, I would say to you, Initially, yes, there's going to be some reaction, but there's this balance between reacting and acting. For instance, dragons are attacking, we've got to go hide, is much more of a reacted reaction than dragons are attacking, I'm going to go get my super crossbow. Um, and yes, it's a reaction, but the next step is to go do something about it. Um, and the do something about it is like, I'm going to, the reason I think that scene works is it's not just I'm going to do something about it. Obviously, what everyone else is doing isn't working because the dragons keep attacking. This one character is saying, no, I'm going to try and do something new that maybe will stop the dragons permanently. And that's much more proactive. And I think it's part of why that character works so well in that movie is because from the get-go, we have this sense of everybody else is, is really just reacting. Even though they're fighting, they're not doing anything. And he's trying to stop it. OK? okay but that's a specific example. Really, the idea is you want to kind of look at these. And when we talk about plotting, you want to try and figure out what about these plots, um, plotting methods works for me. Um, how do I like doing this? Do I like try-fail cycles? Do I like the three-act format? Do I like the roadmap method of plotting um, and doing all of these sorts of things? <laughs>